Welcome to the What's Happening Birmingham video podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Jefferson County Department of Health. Hello, everyone. This is Jarvis S. Scott with What's Happening Birmingham. Today, I have the honor and pleasure finally got on the podcast, one of my favorite people. She's doing great things for Jefferson County. Jefferson County, District Attorney for the best Bessemer off, Lanise Washington, DA Washington, good morning. Good morning, good morning to everyone. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. I wanted to bring her on. She's been in office since 2017, correct? Yes, yes. Since, since 2017, I want to bring her on just to talk about all the great things she's doing in her office. So first off, how are you doing this morning? I am doing great. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to be on your podcast. I really do appreciate it. Okay, so for people wondering, I, I told you this before we actually started the uh, interview, what is, in your definition, what is a district attorney and just a quick bio of yourself? Well, well, a district attorney, um, the current role of a district attorney uh, is that, of course, we enforce the laws um, that for, of the Constitution and here for the state of Alabama. Um, and what we do, the district attorneys now, uh, we are very involved in the community. We know in the past that the number of people uh, that were put in prison was not really helpful to the community at large. People have to be accountable for their behavior. But, uh, you know, there was a time before the current DAs uh, that the value or the merit of a district attorney was determined by the number of people that they put in prison. And we all know whether we like it or not, the people that were most uh, placed in, in, in prison were, looked like you and I. So uh, right now we love I put in preventive methods and measures to uh, make sure that crime is is. Um, try to sway crime and deter it, and then hold those accountable, uh, the ones that just got the case of the can't help it <laughs> and commit crime. Okay, so let me back up for a moment. You know, as I introduced you, you as a district attorney for the Bessemer come off division, uh -huh. can you describe why it's broken down that way in here in Jefferson County? Yes, um, we have two divisions. We're probably the only state um, that has a, one county with two divisions, and that goes back some time ago. Um, you have the Birmingham Division and the Bessemer Cutoff Division. Uh, Bessemer Cutoff Division basically starts from Fairfield all the way back to the Tuscaloosa line. It is inclusive of Hoover. Um, we know that Hoover is a part of Shelby County as well as Jefferson County, as well as the Birmingham Division and the Bessemer Cutoff Division. Um, areas like Lake Cyrus and Ross Bridge and places on John Hawkins uh, Parkway are part of the cutoff. Of course, you know, we have Fairfield, Brighton, Lipscomb, Hueytown, Adger, Pleasant Grove, um, Edgewater, those areas, Dolomite. So it's, it's a vast area. Okay. So once you got into office, I looked it up. I was kind of Googling. You did something called Operation Python. What was that? When I um, got into office, Jarvis, um, there was noticeably a lot of crime that was taking place in the cutoff as well as other places, but within specifically within my jurisdiction, the Bessemer cutoff. Um, and I had to do something about it. There were uh, mothers that were calling. We got many calls here about crimes that were being committed and people who were charged with crimes that were not uh, being picked up. And so I created a DA info, uh, DA, um, task force. And that's probably the first DA uh, created task force um, here in Alabama, but it consisted of a multi-agencies of um, law enforcement and it was state, federal, and local. So in 2017, um, I launched Operation Python and I named it Operation Python because we know of Python constraints. So um, we, I wanted to squeeze out the crime, if you would. And um, I spoke with U.S. Marshal Marty Keeley. Um, so with the help of him uh, obtaining federal funds so that the officers can work overtime and it wouldn't be a financial stress on those local law enforcement um, agencies, their um, budgets, we were able from July 7th, 2017 to October 20th, 17, we, uh, there were 126 arrests. 
um, out of that 126, um, there were um, gang members that were identified and arrested. Um, there were 212 warrants, outstanding warrants that were cleared. And amongst those, um, seven of them were homicides. We got 32 firearms off the street, um, uh, over 162,000 street value worth of um, illegal narcotics plus currency. So um, that was a three month operation with um, ATF, DEA, the Sheriff's Apar Department, Mac Center, the task force officers with the US Marshal, as well as Jefferson, um, the state probation and parole. So it was, it was a huge partnership and it was very successful and it allowed people in certain communities to at least get a couple of nights rest without having worry that, you know, that some, there will be gunfire or um, something bad would happen in their neighborhood. Well, I want to go back. You said something about funds. One of the things you initiated was a Project Safe Neighborhoods grant. What's tell me more about that? Well, that was a grant that was um, actually was made available to those who were trying to combat crime in the community. So mm -hmm. this office submitted a grant uh, for Project Safe Neighborhood, and in that grant, still focusing on the deterrence of crime we place cameras, we use the grant monies to place cameras in those areas within the cutoff that were underserved in um, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So we know that it's not going to um, stop the crime, but it would aid in those law enforcement officers in their um, investigation as to who did what or who saw what, because we know now that we live in a, a time and an age that no one, you can see something happen, see a murder committed, but um, no one wants to speak up or uh, definitely not testify in court. So these cameras aid law enforcement um, in their intelligence and, and their investigation and um, apprehending suspects to crimes in our community. And I want to say too, uh, we did Operation Phase One in 2017, and we did Operation Python Phase Two um, in in 2021. And there were a number of arrests, same partners, number of arrests, and uh, warrants cleared, um, and cases were referred to federal gun cases were referred to the federal government for prosecution. Those that were um, eligible. Now another thing I saw you did recently was the West Jefferson. Second chance hiring yeah. fair? That was in 2019. We did the second chance um, hiring fair. And what the second chance hiring fair does, it, it allows the opportunity for those uh, people with marred backgrounds, criminal backgrounds, to come face to face with prospective employers, um, to be able to get a job and take care of their families and be productive citizens in the neighborhood and feel proud of themselves. Um, it, we know that right now we live in an automated world. And most of our resumes and job applications are done online. So if you have a, a young college student that is submitting a her his or her resume for a job and you got this glowing resume, but then you have the same person, a, a different resume from someone who um, has had a brush with um, law enforcement and but they're needing a job and they are sincerely wanted to be productive and, and work and work hard. Nine times out of 10, that employer is going to pick that college student. Well, that college student may have, excuse my expression, a stank attitude about working. <laughs> but, but you'll have, you overlook someone that really wants to work and will give you all that they have in order to do a great job and be the breadwinner for their family. So the second chance job fair, um, it gives those people an opportunity to come face to face because those prospective employers, they know that the people that they are coming in contact with that day um, have criminal backgrounds. So uh, I think it's a win-win for, for the community. Now this next program you did, I kind of like this because you all know we like to go out and have a good time and we drink a little bit too much. You created a DUI pretrial diversion pro program. Yes, we did not have a DUI. And it's not to say that um, DA Washington has created this program so people can get drunk and, you know, and do yeah. what they want to do. But this is a program um, that it has certain requirements um, and it, you cannot, you know, have several other DUIs in the past and think that you would be eligible for this program, but it gives you an opportunity to plead guilty into this program. And once you've completed it, 
um, that guilty plea is dismissed and you can get that expunged from your record. Um, so that way that gives you an opportunity. Maybe some of us have made a, a bad decision on New Year's Eve or um, on mm -hmm. Christmas Day or some of these holidays, 4th of July, um, and, you know, may drink too much. And I say we, but that would be me. But, <laughs> but it gives, just to be fair to people and give them an opportunity because we don't always make good choices. So as long as they fit within the criteria, that gives them another opportunity. Yeah, and, and the thing about it too is like one of the things you've been you've been harping on, and you know, like you say, you, you practice, but you also walk in and preach it is diversion, deterrence. Yes, yes. We, I mean, we have to put those things in place um, to um, and to help not only curb crime, but um, those who are who commit the crime, they also have to be held accountable. Diversion programs is an acknowledgement that yes, I've done something wrong. Um, I'm willing to go through these steps to uh, rectify, you know, and, you know, take a responsibility. But at the end, um, I'll have an opportunity to get this expunged from my record or some means that I can still continue to be a productive citizen in the community. Because for the most part, Jarvis, you know, our society, we are really unforgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, even when people go to prison and they've served their time, we are unforgiving. And a person, I just feel that a person should be held accountable. If you commit murder, you should be held accountable for your actions. But we have a generation that is coming up that we need to put tools in place, preventive tools to give them knowledge about the laws, knowledge about things that affect them. And I'm talking about our young people um, that, you know, I do so much in going to the schools and talking with them and, and making them aware of the laws that affect them and the, and the consequences that flow from it and to let them know that it does not just affect them, it affects their families. So, um, you know, that's just one of the things, accountability um, and also, you know, you have redemptive people, but you have to be accountable as well for your behavior. Now, one of the things I wanna go back to earlier you said about crimes, you started doing with the cold case unit. Um, yeah. And tell me about that for a moment. Um, again, once I got into office, um, I was elected in 2016, but did not take office until January 2017. Mm -hmm. And so when I had an opportunity, once I got into the office and started looking at files and cases, um, there were cases in some of the surrounding communities that that was just a police report and no investigation. So oh, wow. when I start inquiring about um, what happened with this case, what happened with that person, um, there were cases that people were killed. I mean, and a dog on the street deserves, you know, better treatment than they did, their families. And oh, I'm wow. real strong about, um, you know, just the families, because once a person life is gone, that's it. We can do, we can't do anything else about that. But every person whose life is snuffed out, they leave behind a family. They leave behind a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, children. And so um, what we do is trying to make sure we do things to empower um, the families that are left behind, which leads me to my candlelight vigil um, mm -hmm. that we do every year. I started in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. We... Um, I don't, I, and I can't recall what even prompted me to get this bell, but we always borrow the bell from the fire department. And um, during National Crime Victims Awareness Week, we use one day to um, we'll have a speaker to give information about healthy relationships or domestic violence or, you know, or, or even a survivor. Um, and we give information, we invite families to come and to receive that information. And what we have done is 2017, we went back, we called the names of those people who were um, taken away from their families by gun violence. And we would call the name and uh, Jarvis, it was, it, was so, it, it was so impactful. I didn't realize how impactful it was for the families, but they wore their t-shirts, they wore their buttons. And when it, it can be a crowded room, but when we start calling the names of those individuals that are lost, mm -hmm. their families step stand up and we told the bell and we call their name. 
Um, and that has been an impactful thing to this community. We want to let the victims know that it doesn't matter what the character of your loved one was. That's not our concern right now. We want to empower you with tools so that you can pass on information to make better decisions, um, to make sure that you can do what, whatever you can to make sure that you don't have another loved one to suffer like your last relative. Yeah, and, and, then, and then another thing I saw you start instituting was a conviction integrity unit. Started that this year in January. Mm -hmm. um, even before I um, came into office, I was elected, I started reading a lot about conviction integrity units all across the, the, these United States. And I was intrigued by it. And when I started, when I ran and, you know, campaigning, one of the things that I wanted to do was start a conviction integrity unit. And it would not have worked so well um, if we would have just had it in the Bessemer cutoff, because we would only be able to review those cases of people who are asserting absolute innocence, um, who live within, that were convicted within the cutoff. Um, it would not have been fair to just to do half of the cutoff, but we had to have a, a partner on the other end that shared that vision so that we can have that for the entire Jefferson County. So uh, when Danny was elected um, district attorney, that was perfect. We have worked together on so many things and programs uh, for the entire Jefferson County. And um, I had the opportunity of, of meeting and talking with Barry Sheck on this, pro on this project, as well as Brian Stevenson. And even um, there were some district attorneys and some essence they're referred to as state attorneys um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that gave me information about their offices and how they run their program. Um, so this is the very first um, conviction integrity unit in the state of Alabama. And I was proud to um, you, to join in and bring Danny in. And so mm -hmm. we've been bring, giving back to the community in that manner. Now, you took office, of course, in the last couple of years. But I guess as we're doing this taping of this interview, we are in this continuing COVID-19 pandemic or feels like an endemic or whatever. <laughs> how is that? How has your office managed all of this so far? Well, you know, the district attorney's office cannot shut down. Uh, we issue warrants, all felony warrants that come um, through the juris, um, Bessemer uh, cutoff jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. We work with the clerk's office and making sure that those warrants are uh, put in the system and put in place so that those individuals, those suspects can be apprehended. And those who have already been apprehended, we've got to make sure that their constitutional rights are not violated and everything is done in a timely manner. But what I did, I just staggered the work schedule um, of, of teams, teams of assistant DAs, investigators, administrative staff, um, even my victim service officers. Um, and during that time, we did staggered schedules so that if one person got sick, the office still could go on. And um, the, our victims, um, at one point, it was just so crazy when COVID hit. Everybody was scrounging around, trying to figure out how to do um, Zoom, how to do WebEx. And, and, you know, so it was crazy. But um, in terms of the jails, when people were let out, in some instances, um, they were really trying to clear the jail so that they can kind of lower the probability of people contracting COVID and spreading it with, um, throughout. And so a lot of people that were um, domestic violence um, charges, they were being turned around and, and re, you know released. But I felt, and I told my victim service officers that we needed to contact those victims to let them know um, uh -huh. that person had been released. So we were full speed ahead. We even used that time, Jarvis, to pull, I know we probably cleared over uh, about 400 old cases. Um, oh there were cases on the shelf that probably been there forever um, that didn't move forward. So you, you got people's lives in a holding pattern. Um, if you're not going to do anything with it, then you might as well dismiss it. 
So we did that and we continued on with grand juries and we set up safeguards um, so that those people who were serving grand jury uh, could feel safe. Uh, we pre uh, prepared lunches so they wouldn't have to go out. Uh, we did the shields and we did the sanitizing the room. We did the mask, um, everything that we could do to make sure that those serving uh, um, their jury duty service, their civic duty, um, would feel safe and continue to come back and continue to serve. What do you feel is going to be the biggest challenge now in the next couple of months? Now, you know, like, you're still in the pandemic, but kind of continuing and everything. Well, people have somewhat gotten used to the word COVID. And um, in some instances, to me, it's kind of been desensitized. You have many people that are saying, please get your COVID shot and please get your vaccination. Please get your booster. But there's another part of us that have become somewhat desensitized in that we're getting used to the word COVID and we're not using those safeguards that we need, even when variants come about. So um, I'm hoping what would I see um, going forward um, is uh, hopefully people will continue to get the booster, get vaccinated um, so that we could continue to do business. Uh, I guess it's going to be a new normal, but <laughs> I would say to do business as normal, but uh, business within our new normal. But I, I, I've got to say, even with COVID, uh, we've learned a lot of different new innovative ways to do business. Um, mm -hmm. Before COVID, we, whenever there was a meeting, we had to meet with someone. You get in your car, you rush across town, you got to find a parking place, you run inside. Mm -hmm. So now you can have four or five meetings a day and, and just sit in your office um, and still be productive. So uh, COVID has not been, it's taken away a lot of family members and a lot of chairs are empty this season, this Christmas and Thanksgiving past um, Thanksgiving season. But it, um, I choose to look at the glass half full rather mm -hmm. than half empty. So um, hopefully going forward, we just learn how to best uh, prepare and how to best um, safeguard ourselves, our family, and continue to do business um, and run this country like it needs to be run. Okay. It's one more program I just want to mention. I'll be remiss if I don't mention it. You did the Bessemer Cutoff Public Information and Safety Forum. That was one that I created um, to um, invite law enforcement and as well as um, community stakeholders to sit in a room together and we would have just share information. Um, we were thankfully um, Lawson State allowed us to use their room that, that has been a great partner with this administration. Um, they allowed us to use um, one of their rooms and we would provide lunch and have speakers we've had uh, the director um, of this area, ATF. We've had uh, a person from Jefferson County Coroner's Office um, just to provide information um, to those law enforcement officers, the information that is most helpful. Uh, we've had uh, one forum, we had Patrick Lamb to come and it was right at the end of the legislative session to come and talk about um, the new laws that affect the way um, officers police in the community and uh, mm -hmm. laws that affect us generally. So I think it's very important. Networking is key. Uh, you can't do anything working in silos. Uh, we have to partner together in order to, to make a positive difference. We can make a difference, but I want uh, to make a positive difference. And when I leave this office, and it's amazing, it's almost the, the, to see the things that we've been able to do um, and my term is, is almost ended <laughs> for this first term is almost um, six years, but I, I have enjoyed um, serving this community. I love my community and I, I believe that we should give back um, and we should work. If you're elected, you are a public servant. You need to do those things to make your community better. And Jarvis, I just got to say each year we've done um, something different brought something different to the communities like you know just kind of rehashing as 2017 we did the candlelight visual and the dui deferred program then in 2018 we got the victim service um unit and i don't think we talked about that but my victim service unit when i um served as one of the assistant da's for this same office that i now serve as the elected da um the it was the duty of the assistant da to you know, let the victim know what's going on. And if they're in court 
and um, there's a procedure gone, going on and something is said and they don't understand. So that family wants that DA to talk to them. Then you got the judge saying, you know, all right, uh, Ms. Washington, your next case. And the family is like, what just happened? So um, it was very important to me to get um, have a victim service unit that will kind of navigate victims through the court system and um, and just kind of be there for them, hold their hands and give those outside referrals whatever they need um, for help. And so in um, 2018, um, Governor Ivey signed a $6.3 million grant that was presented by uh, the Office of Prosecution Service. They saw my vision and um, entered a, a grant and it was approved. And so that $6.3 million allowed 88 victim service workers to be placed in um, the DA's office in the state of Alabama. So I was very happy about that. And then um, in 2019, we started the Helping Families Initiative, whereby kids that are in school with behavioral issues and chronic absenteeism, they're referred, referred to our program. Um, so that, and the whole point of that is to kind of divert that child from the prison pipeline, also to strengthen the unity of the family. We triage that child and that family to see what's going on that is prohibiting that child from being his very best and producting, um, doing everything that he or she can do to be uh, a good student in school. So in doing so, we get involved with the families and um, help them with the referrals that they need. It's amazing, Jarvis, there are so many hurting children and families out here, you would be amazed. Um, so that was um, in 2019, as well as the second chance job hiring uh, fair. And then in 2020, we did the Project Safe Neighborhood grant, and we're actually in the process of doing yet another grant, uh, Project Safe Neighborhood. And then in 21, we had the CIU, the Conviction and Integrity Unit, um, where, you know, one person in prison for a crime that they did not commit for one day is just one day too many. So uh, we've pushed the crime, um, conviction integrity as well as we had a vaccination drive through. Um, my church is a great partner in this community, New Bethlehem Baptist Church. And um, my pastor, um, Pastor Rogers, allowed me to set up and have an outside drive-through vaccination. We had information about child care resources, uh, voting information, and just a number of other things. And um, we partnered with Cahaba Medical to have the vaccination clinic. And I just felt that that was important to uh, push that, to make it available to people so that they will know this is something, that expectation that you take care of yourself and you take care of your family. It's a public health issue. And as well as to me, it's just a, a, a safety issue. So okay. we have a lot, <laughs> and I've had fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long six years. So as this year comes to a close, I know we covered a lot in the interview. What final thoughts, and I know people, a lot of people watch my podcast, you know, they see, they see the thing they read online, they see the news clippings, they, and, and that person that believe that, you know, crime is getting worse. What would you tell that person what your office is trying to do to stop that or reduce it? Well, my office work under, my mission is a three-pronged mission. We promote public safety. We uh -huh. uh, maintain the, the uh, community trust and we empower our young people for the future. That is a huge umbrella, but um, Jarvis, I just believe knowledge is power. When we, we, we have to work on the uh, reactive end in terms of when people commit crimes, um, they have to be held accountable. And we also, not just for the victim, we have to safeguard the constitutional rights for those defendants as well to make sure that justice is fair and balanced. Um, but we, we have to um, just do those things to educate the community. On the preventive end, you have okay. to educate so people can make better choices. At the, at the end of the day, it's up to individuals to uh, either make that left when they get to that pathway that goes right or left, it, the decision is theirs. But as a public servant and um, in this community, I feel that it is my obligation and it's certainly my honor to let people know about the laws that affect them and to try and do implement those things um, to for those who have been through the system to let them know you are welcome back to be a productive citizen in this community. Welcome back. Uh, a family is stronger when they're together. And, um, and that's just um, how I roll. <laughs> yeah, and the most important thing too is like, 
you know, and special people that's watching it, and, I, and I'll say this because you would be better. If you see something, say something. Yes. You know. Just but Jarvis, it. people don't do that. That's why I had to get those cameras. People don't do that. <laughs> yeah. You know. So they want to reach your office. What's the phone number? The phone number here at the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office for the Bessemer Division is area code 205-497-8610. Um, if you have any questions regarding um, victim services, if you have, as long as we can answer them, um, as long as they're in within the Bessemer cutoff jurisdiction. And if we can't, then we will um, gladly refer you to the correct person that could assist you in your needs. But uh, we, we're a community service. We, we're community oriented. Um, and like I said, but we hold people accountable. One day I, you know, I'll be hugging my babies and, and reading to them and, and giving them knowledge about the law. But then the next time we'll be prosecuting the individual who snuffed the life of someone um, that they had no right to. No one have the right to take the life of another and they have to be held accountable. Well, District Attorney Washington, thank you for coming on my podcast. Sorry, it's been a little bit overdue, but as you can tell, she's been very busy, everybody. So, uh, <laughs> thank you so welcome. much, Jarvis. I appreciate yeah. you. Yeah, you're always welcome to come back in the future. Thank you all for watching this podcast. Please check out what's happening, Birmingham.com. For more interviews, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and check out this audio version of Apple Podcasts. Thank you all again and have a great day. Bye bye. Merry and Christmas. Merry Christmas. I like the in the background. Bye, everybody. Thank you for watching the What's Happening Birmingham video podcast. Please check out our website app or subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest videos today.